So you probably already noticed that the scripture for last week is, uh, was just the first part of the scripture for this week. So as you might expect, there's a connection between the two. And last week we were uh, speaking about the church as the place where we seek unity in the midst of our diversity. And I think if that was last week's message, this week is kind of the, the other side of that. In other words, how do we find our best selves in the church? And how does God help us to do that? And particularly through uh, the ministry of small groups. So that's what we're uh, trying to work with today. Let's take a minute and we'll pray together. God, we are grateful just for everything that you've given us. We're grateful for the opportunity to be in worship this morning. And uh, just ask your blessing upon the time that we spend here thinking about the scripture, thinking about the way that you're at work in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, in the life of your church. We are incredibly grateful just to be here and pray that you will bless us with a word that we need to hear this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So there was a man named Taylor who for years led the men's ministry in his church. And Taylor built this men's ministry from nothing uh, with God's help into something that was really a major force in the life of the church. And in so doing, he saw many, many lives transformed. But as sometimes happens, this church went through a major transition. And that transition left Taylor feeling hurt and disappointed. And so he decided, you know, he needed a break. So he decided to drop out for a while and he gave up coming to church. And so for a while, everybody felt like, you know, this will blow over. He'll come back. And as it went along for a while, um, he wasn't coming back. And it was clear that he wasn't coming back. So eventually, the men decided that they couldn't just let this be. They had to do something. And so their solution was kind of a, uh, let's say it was a quite a manly kind of solution. They went and they camped out on his front lawn, like literally set up tents on his lawn and brought grills and smokers and they ran uh, extension cords from the neighboring homes, you know, so they could watch TV while they were there. And, you know, made a party of it. And they made signs. The signs said things like, you know, we love you, Taylor, uh, you know, come out and see us, you know, all those kinds of things. So this went on for a couple days, and the cops were called. And when Taylor came out onto the porch to speak to the police, the, the men who were on the lawn cheered, right? They cheered because they finally were able to see him, right? And then, you know, this happened a couple more times. And finally, you know, one time when Taylor stepped out on the porch, he just began to cry because he couldn't believe that there was anybody who would do this for him. I wonder, you know, is there anybody in your life who would do that for you? Is there anybody in your life for whom you would do that? The church when we're at our best is the place where we find people who would do something that crazy for us. That's how we are at our best. I remember years ago uh, talking with someone and they were saying, yeah, you know, they're my, they're my church friends, but they're not my friends' friends, you know what I mean? And I knew exactly what she meant, right? In other words, we say hi to each other on Sunday, but that's pretty much the extent of our interaction. That's it. And for a lot of people who engage with the church, you know, kind of only on Sunday or engage with their faith only on Sunday, you know, that's how we perceive friendships within the church. That's how we perceive being connected. And it was sad, because if you really think about the lives of the early Christians, and if you read the book of Acts, I think this is the second week in a row now that I've recommended that we read the book of Acts, right? Then you can see that the church was not about saying hi on Sunday. That's not the kind of relationships that people had with each other. The church was family. These were people who stood by you. And people who stood by you through everything, including in times of persecution as the early church faced. They were people who helped you grow and people who challenged you and people who saw things in you that you could not see in yourself, both good and bad. And that's what the second part of this scripture is about, the part that we read today in verses 7 through 16. And I'm just going to quote a few phrases here that kind of make sense together when you string them uh, together. So it's about equipping the saints for the work of ministry. It's about building up the body of Christ. It's about coming to maturity, about growing up in every way into him who is the head, into the full 
measure of the stature of Christ. I know that that sounds idealistic, and it is idealistic, to believe that we could experience such a community. And I would hesitate to talk about it, except that you know it's something that I have known myself. It's something that I've experienced and lived, and in fact, it's part of the reason, a large part of the reason why I'm standing here. If it had not been for small groups in the life of the church, I certainly would not have discovered this calling on my life. So there's something different about bringing people together in a community of faith than bringing people together in most other places in the world. I mean, when we're bound together, not only by our relationships to each other, but we're also bound together by our uh, mutual relationship with God through the Holy Spirit, then something happens. Something happens because God is present in that place. And that's where we get, you know, the reps this week changed our words at the back of the, uh, at the back of the sanctuary. So now we see our three words, love and serve and transform, right? And so we see that transform, that transformation happening. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. And that's something I believe. When two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, he is there. Now, there are certain things that happen here on Sunday mornings. We come together, and this was, again, largely a part of what we were talking about last week. The idea that when we come together, we have this common message. This is the reason why when, if I'm preaching, I preach all three services. If Kathleen's preaching, she preaches all three services. Why? Because we want there to be a unity of theme, a unity of message that we're thinking about you know, throughout the week. We want there to be a commonality, a coming together around one common thing. Regardless of which service you come to, this is what you're going to hear. Because we want together to come to some new understanding, a new insight. Some, something new that's going to drive us out into the world to do something different. And so we gather to praise God. We gather together to kind of transcend all the things that we carry with us throughout the week. To find inspiration and to find strength to be able to get us through the days to come. And so worship is a big part of that love God you know, component of our mission statement. But the work of transformation, I believe, really comes in much smaller gatherings. We can, we can be affected by what happens in worship. But the transformation, I think, happens when we're together in much smaller groups of people. Why do you think it is that people go to AA? People go to AA because within that group, that small group of people where you're known, right? It's kind of the idea of the sponsorship. Within that group, you have a common mission. You want to stay sober, right? And that is enough to move people and transform people. And when you have these mutual relationships, you're to be held accountable for what it is that you are or are not doing to stay on that path towards sobriety. So for me, some of my most powerful experiences in small groups have always been around music. So I've been, literally, you know, my life has changed because of times I've spent playing in bands that led churches in worship. That, for me, has been an important part of my journey. And music, to me, always helps to build that purpose because you're working together to create one thing. It has built within its structure any sort of ensemble. You're trying to work together to create one thing that is beautiful. Right? And you can see that this morning when the bells ring in just a little while. You see each, you know, this is one note, right? And that's all it is. It's one note. And I could ring them randomly and it wouldn't sound like anything. But we could work together and do something and produce something amazing. And that's what we hear every time the bells play, every time the choir sings. So for me, that music has been something. But small groups gather around all kinds of different purposes. You know, another group might gather around a specific ministry. I think about the prayer shawl ministry, which is the physical act of creating something, right, that we present to someone as a way of giving them comfort and strength and an acknowledgement that the church is thinking about you, the church is praying for you. And in turn, you know, that becomes a moment of prayer. So that's one way. We often gather, of course, around uh, the idea of study, whether we're studying scripture, whether we're doing some other kind of spiritual reading, you know, that idea of studying together. 
And certainly we gather around prayer. So for me, an important part of any group within the church is that we take the time to hear what it is that people are dealing with. I know that we do this in our youth groups, right? Hey, what are the highs and the lows of your week? What went well? What didn't? Let's talk about that. And let's pray over it. To be able to do that, that to me is an important component of what those small groups are about. To know that somebody is praying for you. To know that somebody even cares enough to ask and really mean it. So I believe that the best small groups have some component of all three of these things. They have a ministry focus, they have some kind of a study focus, and they have some kind of a prayer focus. But usually what you end up with is, at minimum, you get two of those three things, right? So that you have maybe a ministry focus and a prayer focus. Maybe you don't do so much study, but you know what? At the end of the day, it's important that we have at least two of those things. And prayer is always one of them, regardless of what else we do. Prayer is always one of them. Because that's where transformation will begin to happen. That's where we begin to grow. Because when we settle into some kind of a relationship where we know that there is stability and continuity uh, as we go through and we meet week to week or month to month, we know that we're in this safe place where it's okay for us to admit that there are things in our lives that are not going real well, that there are things that we're struggling with, that there are just real burdens that we're carrying. And that's where those things come out, is in those small groups. We need to know that there is a place where we can find grace and forgiveness and love, not only from God, but also from other people who become the face of God in that moment. If we can receive grace from these people that we are in relationship with, then we can be reassured that, you know what, God's greater than any person. So therefore, I can be forgiven whatever it is. So some really amazing things can happen to us spiritually in these small groups. And that's something that I realized that I've been missing since I came down here. You know, I had a couple of different groups, you know, some that I led and some that I just took part in. But obviously, I don't gather anymore with folks from up north. And so I'm in the process now of putting together my own group, right, and trying to form that so that we can have some place to be connected. Because that's important to me. Now, all of us will say, I don't have time for one more thing, right? All of us will say that. And I get that. But what I find is that, just like anything else with respect to the spiritual life, what starts out at first feeling like a burden eventually becomes a gift. So when we start to think about it, it's like, yeah, I really don't want to do that. But once you start to do it, you realize that you can't not do it. It becomes a gift that we give to ourselves, this time that we spend with other people. It's important. Things that will help you grow spiritually. If you want to grow spiritually, pray daily, worship weekly, read the Bible, join a small group. So how might you think about doing that here? Well, in the church, we can talk about all kinds of things. You know, we talked already about our choirs, bell choirs, vocal choirs, right? And you say, well, I'm not musical. Okay, that's fine. There are other things, too. You know, we have Bible study groups. We have a men's group that meets twice a month. We have a group that meets on Wednesday evenings in someone's home. We have a women's group that meets on Thursday mornings. We have adult Sunday school classes. We have the circles of the United Methodist Women. I'm sure that there are others that I'm forgetting. And during Lent, we're going to be putting together some new groups on Wednesday evenings. And so our hope is that we build some momentum around this where people recognize that, well, this is a good thing to get together. And so if you're thinking about a place to connect, and you, maybe you know that that Wednesday night is not going to work for you, come and talk to me. Come and talk with Kathleen, and we'll help to get you connected somewhere. Maybe you're thinking, well, you know what? I would like to put together a small group. You know, I used to lead a group somewhere else, right? And I haven't done that recently. Well, I would really like to do that. Well, come and talk to us and we'll help to get you started. We learn from each other, because growing in faith is not always about imparting knowledge, right? You don't grow necessarily just because you understand things better. You grow because you see people actually put things into practice and see that they work. That's what happens. It's almost like an apprenticeship. Discipleship is more of an apprenticeship than, you know, being under someone's tutelage. And that's what's great about a group. 
because when it's composed, especially of people who are in different places on their spiritual journey, they help each other. Because people who are new to it, they ask questions that people who have been in it for so long haven't considered for a long time. And people who have been part of it for a long time can answer questions that people struggle with that, you know, really, if you step back from them, really are not that hard to deal with. But people get hung up on. So we mentor each other and we encourage each other. And that's what it means when we read in this passage to equip the saints for ministry, for building up the body of Christ. It's in that small group where we grow into our best selves and our most authentic selves. It's when we're challenged to live up to what it is that we say we believe. Because that's something else that that small group can do for us. People can challenge us to say, you know what, why are you doing that? That's not what we say we're about. Why'd you take that step? Why'd you do that? There isn't a lot of places. There aren't very many places at all that we could go to get feedback about how it is that people perceive our, uh, how well we're matching up to what Christ has taught us. Not too many people are willing to share that. But within that small group, it becomes a safe space where we can challenge each other. And that's where the speaking the truth in love comes in. You know, I remember uh, when I started with the praise team in North Carolina, and this just kind of illustrates, you know, how people will see us struggling with things. We think we're hiding them very well. But people will see us struggling with things, and they'll maybe lift it up before we would ever expect them to. And so when I was in North Carolina and I was thinking, kind of wrestling with a call to seminary, uh, I remember sharing this at a retreat that we were on as a band. We had rented a, a house at the shore and we were playing music there over a weekend. Uh, and so during one of our prayer times I shared, okay, this is what I've been wrestling with. And there was a woman there who said, I just knew that there was something, something that was going on in and I've been praying for you for weeks, just seeing this. One of the things that that group did for us when we moved was, uh, it was like maybe a day or two before we moved. They showed up at dinner time, about 12, maybe more people, including the associate pastor, came, and the associate pastor being very good at moving, uh, he was in charge of packing the truck. <laughs> but everybody else, packed everything that was in the house. And I swear I've never seen a house get packed so fast. Having moved that many times, I often think, well, where, are these, where are they now, right? They come and help me now. But that was one of the greatest experiences, I think, to know that we were really loved and cared for. And I never would have asked for that kind of help. But they didn't ask me if they could come either. They just showed up. That was the thing. They showed up and they brought dinner. That was the greatest thing. So those were real church friends. So I want you to think about this morning, you know, do you have people in your life that you would do that for? And do you have people who would do that for you? If not, then I do believe it's time for us to make that connection. Amen?